Thank you, Bill. Excellent. Um, now I'd like to introduce to the stage Erica Karp, who will introduce the next session with uh, Michael Bloomberg and Curtis Ravenel. Erica? So it's, um, it's amazing to be able to introduce uh, Mayor Bloomberg and, uh, and Curtis. And, um, and Bill's comment about long-termism, I'm struck that long-termism really does mean uh, resilience to disruption. And, um, and that's particularly interesting when you get to talk about Michael Bloomberg. Um, it was Abraham Heschel who said that the opposite of love is not hate. It's indifference. And so when it comes to Michael Bloomberg and some of the things that he does uh, that seem maybe crazy and that some people hate, no one's indifferent, which is wonderful. So when you think back, and, and um, Mayor Bloomberg has roofs in, um, in New York City painted white so that we can save on, uh, on power. Or he stands up in um, congregations like my own synagogue where he fights uh, for the critical right to marry, marriage equality. Or he works to create an organization near and dear to my heart called SASB. Uh, many of you know SASB, where we fight uh, for the idea of um, disclosures, standards for disclosures around critical environmental, social, and governance factors. Or he thinks about the idea of carbonated soft drinks and the fact that we are driving through them obesity and diabetes, and he fights. So from the standpoint of Mayor Bloomberg's position, again, there's no indifference. Um, there's progress. And uh, what I would say also, I'm, I'm reminded, this is a, a Ronald Reagan said, if you can't make them see the light, then make them feel the heat. <laughs> So in any case, for me, again, uh, knowing Michael a bit, knowing Curtis, uh, it is an, a great honor to be able to introduce them to you. Thank you. Where are they? Michael, Michael. Michael. Here's Michael. There we go. <laughs> Facial hair is new. <laughs> hey, Bill. Good to see you again. Erica, thank you. Good afternoon. Hello. Well, it's good to see you all again. I've, I've been here before, and I'm glad to be able to interview Mike uh, this go around. I think the idea of long-termism is obviously something that, that Mike's thought about quite a bit. Um, and we'll dive right into it. First of all, actually, I want to thank um, Bill and Mark uh, and Daryl and CECP for, the, uh, for having us, number one. Charlie, nice to see you. Uh, and the Strategic Investor Initiative is important. Bloomberg's a part of it, and we're really excited about it. So thank you all for your support. Um, Mike, you just wrote a book, Climate of Hope, with former Sierra Club President Carl Pope, in which you express optimism that bottom-up solutions are the answer to climate change. Why are you so optimistic? Well, for a start, if the alternative is we're all going to turn this planet into Mars, you might as well be <laughs> optimistic. Uh, <laughs> no reason to be pessimistic. You're not going to be around if you're right. Um, seriously, I think uh, climate change and lots of problems in life are really small problems, individual problems, and if you attack each one of them, you can make some progress in the grand scheme of things. There are very few things that you can attack on a revolutionary way. It's evolution that got us where we are, and it's going to take us forward. And uh, what's happening to the climate uh, this 17 out of the last 18 hottest years on record have been since the year 2000. So if you don't believe in climate change, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, what is true, however, is the consequences of killing everybody on the face of the earth, no matter how remote the possibility is, expected mean value is something you should pay attention to. And when people say, oh, I don't believe it, can you imagine a CEO in front of her or his board and saying, well, I'm not going to move the plant. Screw it. I don't think the oceans are going to get higher. 
uh, the board did say, wait a second, what's your backup plan? Where's the wall you built? What's the backup facility? That sort of thing. And when you watch the crazies on Fox News, it, it's the former has-beens are never business people. They're uh, generally journalists um, who don't ever have to really worry about it. But nobody's going to say to their board, I don't believe it. I'm not going to take any uh, precautions. And... Um, the, what you see here is there's a lot of pollution caused by coal. You can do something about that. We've closed, or the Sierra Club really, funded by us and some others, have closed 268, I think it is, coal-fired power plants in this country. That's more than half the coal-fired power plants. It's brought down uh, greenhouse gases dramatically in this country. And there's a lot of pressure to continue with this uh, closing of plants. In fact, the number, the rate of closure since Donald Trump was elected is greater than it was before. So we really are making a difference there. There are people who are going to more fuel efficient cars. There are people that convert their electricity incandescent bulbs to LEDs. Um, and complex fluorescent. Um, you can, as uh, Erica mentioned, if you paint your roof white, you reflect off enough of the sun that even here in New York City, you reduce your Con Ed bill by 25%. And I'll never forget, Al Gore and I were on the, he's the one that invented the internet, if you don't remember. <laughs> I was, Al doesn't like that when I said it. <laughs> Uh, Al and I were on a roof in Queens, I think it was, with most of the buildings like five stories and flat roofs. And there we were with our rollers painting the roof white, and the post had us dressed as clowns or something on the front page. Um, but today, if you fly in and out of LaGuardia, look down, every roof is white. And the handful that are not, I guarantee you, are empty buildings held by the banks or somebody they can't find. Because for two cans of paint, you cut your electricity bill People are going to pay attention there. So there are individual things you can do, and we are making progress. And you don't have to have everybody in the world do them. Common sense says there'll always be some countries that, for selfish reasons or just stupidity, aren't going to take actions that will help us all, although they will benefit from our actions. But it just means we've got to do what we can. Yeah. China is one of the countries that is the most pro-environmental country in the world right now. They have this enormous problem you can't see across the streets, and they're trying to do something about it. On the other hand, India next door, you see pictures of people carrying coal out of the mines in their arms. There's a job problem there, and they, Modi is trying, but are nowhere as near as aggressive at actually making progress. So this, you know, America's going fine. We'll do fine without uh, the federal government, and uh, China's going to do its part, and India may down the road, and... You know, they're individual things. Keep working. Well, you know, you talked about individual things, but they're, you're also known for collective action. And after Trump announced the U.S. withdrawal from Paris, you launched an effort called America's Pledge to, uh, to ensure that the U.S. meets its goals. Can you talk a little bit about that effort and what it means? Well, number one, the federal government hasn't done really anything. Uh, Obama did pass a piece of legislation or got a piece of legislation passed. Uh, but it has never been enforced. Uh, it's in, tied up in the courts. So when Trump says he stopped the Obama plan, he didn't really stop the Obama plan. It was never implemented. And who knows whether it ever will be. Uh, but without the federal government, we're going to be just fine. And when Obama or Trump said we're going to pull out of COP21, and my hope is that he does not, that in the end there's enough pressure. And like a lot of the things uh, the president says there are ideas that he just sort of formulates on the fly, and when he gets into the details, they really don't get implemented. So he might, we may never drop out of COP21. But even if we did drop out, uh, the, all of the progress that we have to make in America is made by individual people and individual country, uh, companies and local governments. And those things can go on without the federal government. Yeah. So what we said is, look, uh, America has an obligation to pay, I think it was $15 million over the next five years to an organization which keeps track of um, who's doing what they'd promised it, or not doing what they promised it, at this Paris thing, COP21. And, okay, we'll pony up the money if the federal government doesn't pay. Uh, I don't know what that says. If the federal doesn't, government doesn't pay, a few of us are going to pay kind of mismatch, but okay, we'll come up with the money <laughs> some way or other. And um, you have 2,000 odd uh, companies and cities and organizations that have joined. Investors, yeah. And we call this America's Pledge. Jerry Brown, the governor of California, has been very helpful in that as well. 
and Carl Pope, who you mentioned before, who co-wrote this book with me, used to run the Sierra Club. And together we have uh, coalesced together and excited people uh, to do more than we would have done if Trump had stayed out of it. I mean, in the end, he was a godsend for us because he got people to say, oh, I'm not going to let that happen. I'll do my part. And you all will likely be reached out to at some point to help join the coalition if you haven't already. So thank you. Um, you've been very active working with cities to reduce emissions and, as you said, Sierra Club, uh, uh, to close these coal plants around the country. Why cities and why coal specifically? Well, coal is the most polluting fuel that we use uh, maybe in, in, certainly on any scale. Yeah. Um, and coal, we have a lot of it. Uh, but it is so polluting that the estimates are it killed about 13,000 people a year. That's been cut down in half, seven odd thousand, uh, because we are putting a lot less pollutants into the air. And if you live downstream from a coal-fired power plant, I would suggest you uh, start picketing right away. You don't want your kids breathing that air. And it's really a very local thing. We one time in New York City, when I was mayor, we plotted on a piece of paper just on the X, Y axis, where kids who go to the hospital with asthma attacks live, and you plot the roads right through Manhattan, all these big trucks go through Manhattan. It's interesting, if you look at all of the Hudson River crosses, uh, um, uh, under and over the river crossings, you pay tolls coming east. Yeah. If you look at the Verrazano Bridge, you pay them going west. So trucks go one way through the city and the other ways, the other ways, to avoid paying tolls. And that puts an enormous amount of traffic in New York City, which you don't need. But Susan Molinaro, whose father was the borough president of Staten Island, and she was a congresswoman, in order to curry favor with the people on Staten Island, got in the federal legislation the requirement that the Verrazano goes in the other direction to cut half the traffic that would have otherwise gone through Staten Island. It's a very clever piece of legislation. Not good for the rest <laughs> of us, but that's okay. Um, but anyways, uh, coal is very bad. There are alternatives. Uh, natural gas is so plentiful and so e inexpensive that it really gives an impetus to anybody that owns a coal-fired power plant. Forget about whether they believe or not and that's damaging the world. The economics are forcing everybody in the Sierra Club and is, is really been helpful and picketing is helpful and all that sort of stuff. But I think it's fair to say that uh, the, the economics are forcing people to do that. Some countries don't have a lot of natural gas and so they can't really do that or it'd be more expensive to get rid of coal. It's also true that renewables have become so cheap that in many cases they are a very good alternative, even the cheaper than natural gas. The problem with renewables are that the sun doesn't shine all the time, the wind doesn't blow all the time, and until you solve the battery problem, which we're getting to, but it's not there, most, there are big power plants, uh, companies, that are gonna rely on solar or wind, but only for part time. Yeah. And then they have to have a backup and that hopefully will be natural gas, which is still a fossil fuel and still pollutes, but nowhere is near as much as coal. And, and the cities, incidentally, it's the problems are in the cities because we are using the energy. The pollutants may come from a power plant 200 miles away, but if you reduced your energy consumption here, you would reduce the amount of pollutants mm -hmm. they put in the air. Um, so in relation to this group too, especially, you're, you're chair of two things. Uh, that are around information disclosure and intended to get better information to investors. One is uh, you were appointed to the task force on climate-related financial stability, or disclosure rather by Mark Carney, looks at climate change from a market perspective. You're also chair of SASB, which focuses on broader sustainability reporting. Why are investors, you think, concerned about climate risk? And what are you trying to do with SASB and the task force to help? Well, them? the task force and SASB are to let investors see what companies are doing and use that in the decision-making process if they so choose. Right. I can just tell you from my company, when we interview people uh, for a job, the first thing they ask us, because the review process has been turned around someplace between <laughs> when I look for a job and, and now, and uh, they want to know what you're doing in the environmental space. 
And if you say, in, in, I, in our case, I say, well, Bloomberg's giving all its profits to its foundation and we work on a number of things, that's a big positive. If you say the company is, uh, we generate a lot of our own electricity, that's a big uh, plus. And it's what we use in competition with other companies who are trying to hire the same people. Um, companies are worried about their customers wanting to deal with an environmentally friendly country, uh, company. They are worried about their employees wanting to work for an environmentally friendly company. And they're particularly worried about the big investors who are getting pressured from their beneficiaries to only invest in environmentally friendly uh, companies. And so a lot of what's driven by this is you got to stop and think, Who's the beneficiary? Why do companies do things? Uh, I saw today Delta and American, I think it was, two airlines that said they were going to terminate their relationship with the NRA. They have a benefits program. Why did they do that? They don't care what the NRA does. They care about their customers, which is the public. Congress is not rushing to walk away from the NRA. Why? Because their customer is the NRA. It's the NRA that's funding their campaigns. And so everybody that says, oh, they're going to change now because of this terrible tragedy of 17 kids getting killed or 57 people in, uh, in Las Vegas, I don't think they are going to change. They'll do some meaningless stuff, but they still want to get their monies from the NRA and their support from the people who are NRA members. And Delta and American have made the decision they're going to have to fly sometime anyway. So if all the airlines pull out of supporting the NRA, they get a freebie, if you will. They, people, they look good, and it doesn't cost them anything. Mm -hmm. You know, and obviously, on the information front, getting this comparable information you talked about and what Bill talked about earlier, long-termism, having a longer view on issues that may or may not be immediate is important. And obviously, as a firm, Bloomberg invests in making good information available to its customers. Um, and so for us, it makes sense to invest in, in these uh, initiatives that provide better information. Our goal as a firm, right, to help invest. Well, I've always been fascinated with people that say companies can't have long-term plans because of the demand on quarterly earnings. And all you have to do is look at Jeff Bezos to see that's not true. What you have to do is say to your investors, look, we're going to be long term and uh, have the consistent message. And then they will, not all of them, but most will ride with you through quarterly downturns as well as upturns. You have to explain it to them. You have to tell them what you're doing and why this quarter was bad or whatever. But the, this argument that you can't plan for the long term it doesn't make any sense to me. And in fact, I would not want to invest in a company that was only investing for the short term or only running their business for a short term. Things are changing. Every business is being disrupted. Um, I thought uh, Bill's uh, comments about Eastman Kodak were, were dead on. Uh, you know, if, who would have thought that if, if you take a look at the change today, what's happened in the last 10 years in every one of our businesses, because we live with it, you don't see it, but go back and, and see. It's hard to believe, but 10 or 15 years ago, people didn't have any uplink capability. Forget about the 10 gigabyte uplink capacity that I have to have on my phone. And the, techno the, the estimates are that you'll have more new technology for the next, in the next decade than we've had from Thomas Edison to today. So just think about that. You've got to plan for the long term. You've got to work for it. And for the environment, you've got to go and try to do some things that will take a long time. It takes a long time to get to build a, a dam, for example, for hydropower. It takes a long time and a lot of money to invest in battery technology or transmission technology to get energy where you need it. Uh, there are the short things you can do, which we talked about, but there are some long things, too, and I think companies have to go and, and think about the long term. They are uh, much too short term focused. And you can say, OK, well, you have a private company. You don't have to answer anybody. But that's not true. You, even a private company, you have to answer to your customers who want to know you're going to be around down the road. You have to answer to your employees who want to make sure they're going to have a, a down the road a, a job and that sort of thing. So speaking of on corporate sustainability, you know, given what we've talked about with the lack of leadership of the federal government, et cetera, do you think the businesses really can lead the way? This is a group of, of business um, uh, leaders and investors. My, my experience in 76 years is in business, just tell us what the rules are. We'll deal with them. 
<laughs> um, it, it, you know, we can spend all the time. Yes, you have a lobbying group and you try to influence the dialogue. But whatever it is, companies, if they are subject to really being hurt by a small change in the law, a tax rate that goes up or down or interest rates that go up and down a little bit, they don't have a business. Yeah. So, you know, Bloomberg, for example, you mentioned a lot of these things. We, we've made some changes based on Sandy to some of our operations as well. Um, so we know about the near-term real impacts of climate change. On that long-term planning, as we see temperatures rise, as we see regulatory changes, especially in Europe, well, how do companies remain resilient, to use Erica's term? How do they do that? Well, you have to sit there and look at every party of business and say, what would happen if it's not there? A good company does that with their employees. We all have succession planning. And I know we had a book which was done while I was in City Hall of every employee, or at least the first 4,000 out of 20,000, whatever it is, and who would be the backup. And when I got and I started looking at the book, there was one person who was a backup for half the job. So. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, you have to plan for the long term. You have to think about what if and what if the technology isn't there or, or changes. Um, could Kodak have really responded when they saw cell phones with cameras built in? I'm not so sure they could have. Maybe they should have gone out and shorted their own stock. <laughs> that they could have done. But uh, could they have gone in and competed with the hardware manufacturers, the Apples and the Samsungs? And in those days, it was other companies. Probably not. Uh, maybe they're just in the wrong place, wrong time, and, and there no, was no salvation. But all of us should assume that everything, no matter how good it is, tomorrow somebody can come along. And what is your game plan? I, in our company, I do think a lot of times about, a lot about um, what will we do. We have some uh, protection because we have a big customer base depending on our technology. So if somebody comes along, we'll have some time to react. But having said that, uh, you can't wait. Let me rephrase it. If you ask your customers and your sales force what your customers need, and if that's what you build, you will be hopelessly behind because it's what everybody else is going to build. And by the time you deliver it, they don't need it anymore. It's the great example of... Uh, somebody was looking for a two-bedroom apartment, asked the agent to show apartments, sees two-bedroom apartments, calls a week later and said, take my name off your list, I just bought a three-bedroom apartment. But I thought you said two-bedroom. Yeah, well, I didn't know what three-bedroom looked like. And it's that kind of thing. You've got to show your customers where they should wind up and build it for them and then try to take them there. It's sort of leading from the front and leading from the back. That's not to say your customers don't have good ideas. It's not to say you don't have to be responsive and all that sort of stuff. But I don't think your customers or your sales force, or even you, um, are good at foreseeing the future. The future's scary. It's, and particularly, it's hard to believe that they can, somebody can automate you out of existence, your business or your job or something like that. And we just push it out of our minds because maybe you don't have a good solution and you can't go through life thinking about everything going to zero. Just never get there. The good news is if you're my age, you're not going to see most of it. So. <laughs> Well, with that, Mike, I'm going to conclude. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Happy. Happy.